Thank you guys again for being here today. Super excited uh, for this week of this series uh, because I get to jump in uh, into something that I love, and I'm going to explain what that is. I think a lot of other people love it too. Hopefully, it's going to be great. My mic is being weird today, guys, but it's okay. Uh, And I want to start off by making a statement, okay? You're like, oh my goodness. Um, How many of you guys know, as parents, that in the eyes of your children, if you've got them, grandparents are better? Can I get an amen? Is that anybody else know that? The grandparents are like, that's very true. <laughs> Double amen, right? So Rachel and I, we've got two kiddos, Liam and Ellie Bustos, five and six years old. Yeah, woo, I love my kids too. Um, and they're fantastic. Like they're their own people. They're just the bomb. They're fun. Um, they're funny. Our kids are like growing in humor like crazy, and it's my favorite thing in the world. Uh, but anyways, um, one thing we've learned about our kids as they've gotten older is they know that they love their grandparents, and they're learning why they love their grandparents, okay? Here, come on. Some of you guys know where we're going with this. So grandparents, you're in here, and you're like, yeah, my grandkids love me. Of course they do. I agree, but I would also say they love what you have to offer way more, okay? Can we just be honest? Like, when we ask our kids, we're like, hey, mom and dad are going to go on a date, or we're going to go do this thing, and we're going to spend some time alone, and you guys are going to go hang out with, and they'll finish it Grandma and Papa, and be like, slow down, calm down. You better not drop them off with an aunt. We're not going to an uncle's house. We want to hang out with Grandma and Papa, okay? Like, we need to go spend time with Grandma. My kids are blessed, man. They've got lots of grandparents, lots of people who can show them love, um, and lots of people who can give them things that they want, okay? Like, if we asked our kids, why? Why do you want to go to Grandma and Papa's house? They'd be like, they have many frosted donuts, Dad. <laughs> You know what I mean? How do, does that not make sense to you, Dad? Why else would we want to go to Grandma and Papa's house? They have many frosted donuts. It's like Rachel's dad. They love going to Rachel's dad. That's Papa as well. Papa number two, right? Why do you want to go with him? There is not a time that we're with Papa and we do not end up at Brahms for ice cream, Dad. <laughs> That's why we want to go to Papa's house. like, all right, fair. So again, they love you, but they love what you have to offer more, Okay. Look, so the the reason I say all that uh, is because it's part of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, If we were being super honest, which honesty is the best policy, amen, if we were being super honest today, I think that as adults, we would agree with, or even as young adults, teenagers, we would agree with the fact that 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 little thing about us as humans where we like to go to people or places in hopes that we receive something from it, it doesn't really die out when you grow up. Like that is still deep down something that we kind of have going on in here that we're like, oh, I want to go see that person. I want to go to that place because of what it has to offer. One place that we have a tendency to really see this happen is in our walk with God. Specifically, we see this happen when we go to God in prayer. And that's what we're going to dig into today, okay, is our conversations with the Lord. So real quick, just circling back to, or going to something else and we'll circle back around. Uh, if you've been with us last week, if you were with us last week, we started this brand new series, Heart Shifts. Pastor Josh started us off and what we're gonna be doing uh, is we're gonna dig into these healthy habits of our walk with God, these things that we are called to have, right? We're called to be in God's word. We're called to talk to God, be in prayer with God. We're called to worship the Lord. Last week, Josh talked about our calling to be obedient to the Father's voice because God speaks to us and he calls us and commands us to do these things and we are called to Be obedient to that, right? Because the things that God has for us are good. He wants to connect with us and be close. And ultimately, we're not just talking about the how we do these things, because that feels like the normal tendency in church. It's like, well, how do I pray? How do I worship? How do I talk to God? How do I read his word? And and those are all good things. And we'll dig into those a little bit. But the how is a question that we oftentimes kind of look over. Or excuse me, the why is is a question that we oftentimes look over. Why am I going to God? Why am I talking to him? Why am I getting into his word? Why worship? All these things. And that's what gets us to the heart. What is the heart behind these actions, these habits that I'm implementing into my relationship with Jesus? The why is important. And we're going to dig in that today with prayer specifically. Okay, so uh, circle back to just this conversation on prayer. Uh, And I think Prayer is something that is kind of complex for a lot of us, right? We have a lot of questions when it comes to prayer. Uh, Even if we've been in this relationship with Jesus for a very long time, there's still some things we don't have answered, and that's okay. Uh, But I'll say 
I want to talk about two really big questions that we have with prayer. The first, like I just mentioned, is how do I pray? Like, I, you're telling me when I begin this relationship, I'm supposed to talk to this big guy in the sky who created everything, right, is above everything. If I make a mistake, he can go smite and then it's over. You know what I mean? It's like he can do all these things and you just want me to have conversations with him. Can't see him. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. How? How do I do this? And so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but to answer that question, I actually want to take you to uh, the King of Kings, who uh, has the best answers to everything. His name is Jesus, right? And we're going to see how Jesus tells us that we should pray really quick. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to jump into Scripture right now. We're going to go to Matthew 6, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, verses 9 through 13. And somebody asked Jesus, like, well, how should we pray? What should this look like? What should prayer look like in our lives? And this is how Jesus responds. He says, in this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen? Amen. Come on. So Jesus comes and he's like, here's how you should pray, right? And he gives him this beautiful walkthrough of a prayer to his heavenly father, to our heavenly father. He's like, this is it. This is how you should pray. So when we read that, and a lot of us have probably heard that, even if you haven't been in church a long time, you're like, yep, football team is prayed for every game. You know what I mean? It's like something like prayed at dinner every night, whatever that may be. We've probably heard it. But one thing that we often don't know, unless it's explained to us, is that Jesus's meaning of pray this way was not just repeat this every single time, right? He's saying, hey, there's, a, there's more behind what I'm saying, and what I'm saying has heart all in the midst of it. The heart behind why I say these things this way, how I pray to my heavenly Father. So I want to give you a quick breakdown of what Jesus is actually getting into here. Uh, we talked through this a while back uh, in another series I'm going to point you to in just a second, but the first thing Jesus is saying when he says, our Father, he's saying, hey, when you go to prayer and you want to talk to God, you should know it's about relationship. That when I start, what I need to be reminded of is I'm connecting with my heavenly father, right? My God who wants to be in real, authentic, intimate relationship with me, I'm going to him like I would be talking to my best friend. That's how I get to go into this because it's not just a God and his servant. It's a real connection face to face and I can talk to him about anything, about everything. So connect relationally. The next thing is worship his name, right? He says, hallow be your name, God. You are above all things, God. You are worthy of all praise, God. You gave me the breath in my lungs, just like we sang. So let me pour it back out to you. You are Lord, and I love you. And I need to, I need to have that remembrance, that reverence and reminder that you are the almighty, God. I am speaking really cool complex here to somebody who loves me and is close to me, but is above all things. Do you see that? So I get to worship you in my prayer life as well. The third thing, pray his agenda right? Pray his agenda first. When I go to you, God, I'm gonna, probably going to have some requests. I'm probably going to have some needs, some things going on that I would love to invite you into. But before I even do that, can I be reminded that your way is better than my own? That any plan I may lay out compared to yours will never compare. That you are above it all, that you are king of, uh, of my life, of this world and of my life, God. And so I surrender to you. And I say, Lord, whatever this comes to, just know I want your way over my own. Your will be done. Your kingdom in front. And then the next thing, depend on him for everything. Give us this day, God. We know that we, without our heavenly father, would have and be nothing, right? Sounds kind of cold to say, but the truth is, is he created us. He built us. He's planned out life for us. So it's like to go to him, it's like, hey, just remind myself in prayer, I need you. I need you to become who you've called me to be. I need you to do more, to grow, to get out of just the place that I am and only what I can do. So Lord, I ask for your provision. I ask that you take care of me and give me all that I need. Give us this day. And then the next thing, forgive and be forgiven. Help me to forgive those who do wrong to me, God, because people will do wrong to us. Amen. Lord, help me to forgive those who are doing wrong to those I love. And Lord, help me to be forgiven, not only by those who I've wronged, Lord, but most importantly, help me to stand forgiven in front of you, Jesus, to receive the free gift of forgiveness that you have for me, God. Help me to stand forgiven so I can be in real relationship with you. And the next engage in spiritual warfare, that sounds intimidating, but ultimately we have to be reminded that the devil is out to get us. Amen? He does not want us to succeed in our relationship with Jesus, and that's just a fact, right? To steal, kill, and destroy, that's what he's after. And so Jesus is coming in and saying, don't forget you got an enemy who wants literally the counter of what God wants for your life. And so the only way we get past that and that we're able to keep standing strong against the temptation and the, and the attacks of the enemy 
It's through Jesus. It's through a relationship with him. He comes in and he fights our battles. He wants to come in and fight our battles for us. So it's like, God, help me. Give me the strength from you, God, to resist the temptation of the enemy. Give me strength to withstand the things that he wants to throw my way so I can keep moving forward. That's a part of life. And we need Jesus to get through that, to keep moving in that. And then the last thing, again, it's worship. Express your faith in God's ability for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Again, God, there's nobody like you. And I need you. It's all yours. I surrender to you. I love you. Amen. 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 So just real quick again, that is, that is a picture of how Jesus shows this is how you can pray. This is how you can have a conversation with God. And there's so much more to it. There's so much beauty in it that we oftentimes overlook. So we actually got to be done with the how. Okay. So for some of us, you're like, man, that's really what I need today though. And I hear you on that, but there's some other things that I feel God is calling us to, to jump into today about prayer. But I do want to encourage you again, back in February, we did a series called Words to Nowhere, and it was all about prayer. It actually was specifically us breaking down the Lord's prayer and seeing the heart of the Father and his, his heart for us in conversation conversation with him. It's, if you go to our website, gracelotten.org, and you go to our old our sermon archives and you look in there, it's in there. You can watch all this, the, the whole series and hear more about how to pray. And you'll even get some of the why and the heart behind all that as well. So go take a look at that if you're in that spot. Back to what we're going to today. So the first question, how do I pray? But what I want to dig into today is why. Why do I pray? Now that, the answer to that question might look pretty different for a lot of us. Amen depending on where we are, depending on the season of life we are, what we're praying for in that moment, the reason we just prayed, the why behind it could look pretty different. So I think, let me, just, just to give a few, just to throw a few reasons that we might go to the Father in conversation. First off, we go to God when we have needs, right? I've got stuff going on in my life, God, and I, I need your help. I can't do this alone. There's these things that got to be fixed, and I can't fix them, right? Not a bad thing. Here's where it gets weird. Whenever we decide to do that, or sometimes when we decide to do that, God is our last resort. You ever been there? It's like, I've tried my way, God. I've tried to fix these needs, these, these situations, these circumstances in my life. I realized I can't, so now I'm gonna go to you. That's a great thing. You're still going to the Father. But sometimes it's like, God, you're my last resort, and I just, I just really need you to fix this thing. But is that the only time we go to him? I need this fixed, God. He's the handyman. Come repair this. Okay, thanks. See you later. So that's one thing. Maybe it's wants. You know, God, I'll be real happy if this happened. Come on, that's a real thing, right? Like, man, if my bank account had a couple extra zeros, God, this could be real good. You know what I'm saying? Like, God, I would, I would love, and, and that's okay. It's not bad to pray for wants for things in our lives, right? To pray for things that we might not necessarily need, but want to take those to God. He's like, hey, I'm glad you're talking to me, but it's got a vending machine for us. Is that where we're at? Do we just go? It's like, oh, I just want something sweet. <laughs> That's it. See you later. Sometimes. And then another one is, do we go to prayer because we just are supposed to? When I look at prayer and I go have a conversation with God, at the end of it, I go, okay, I did that for the day. That's done. Check the box. I'm good to go till tomorrow. And I do that because I was just shown by other people in the church growing up, that that's what you're supposed to do. I was told by somebody else, like, you better make sure that you pray every single day. So I just got to check that box. But what I'm missing there is the heart, the real why. Is that where I'm at? Because that's, that's that, I mean, I'll be real with you. That was me for a while growing up and early on in my faith. It's like, oh, I, I got to make sure I spend that time. Got to check that box, check that box. But was I really having conversations with my father? Or was I just going through the motions there? Because, I mean, come on, there's things that we do in our lives that we were shown and just, this is how you do this. And if we're honest, the way we do it isn't necessarily the right way. Like, I'll tell you the truth. I wet my toothbrush twice before brushing my teeth. Water, toothpaste, water. Does that mean it's right? Some of you are like, yes. You know what I'm saying? Some of you are like, who needs water? Nasty, okay? <laughs> you need to put some water on your toothbrush. You know what I'm saying, though? Does it mean it's not necessary? I mean, to each their own sometimes, right? But is that the same with prayer? Can we just, ah, oh, it's just how I do it. It's just, I just, I was told that I just have to pray. Is that the real heart behind prayer? Is that what God is hoping for when he says, come have a conversation with me? Is that you just go, I, I, I said words to you. Can't even remember what they were. I checked the box though and walked away. We all have different reasons sometimes. 
And again, I'm not trying to say that these reasons are necessarily bad. So working backwards, consistency, showing up with God every day, that's a beautiful thing. Praise God for that, okay? Does not mean that's a bad thing, right? Uh, coming to God with, with wants, the desires of your heart. When you, imagine the, your best friend. You can go to them and tell them, man, I just really want this to happen in my life. You're being open. You're being honest, transparent with this person. You can do that with God. God loves when you bring those things to him, right? My needs, who's the only person that can bring them about and make things right? He does. So yeah, he's like, come to me with that stuff. doesn't mean they're a bad thing. First Peter 5, 7, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. He cares about us. He's like, no, I get it. Bring them to me, bring it to me. But the danger, am I just going there for those other reasons? Am I just going to you because I need things fixed? but never any other time. I'm just going to you because I have something I want really bad, but never any time. Am I just going to you because I just was told, and that's what Christians do, we check the box, but never to have a real intimate conversation with you. You see the tension? It's not necessarily bad, but we can get lost. We can get far lost in those things. So here's what this means. What this really looks like is that when it comes to prayer, we need to recognize that the why behind our prayer it does have power. It does matter. Take a look at this, this moment with Jesus. So this is actually before the Lord's prayer. So before he teaches people, here's how you should pray. Therefore, pray like this, right? And this is Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8. He's talking to people. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will ever get, right? He's like, hey, when you're praying, you look at these guys and they're out there in the streets. They're like, holy, holy, holy. <laughs> Our Father. You know, and like they're like, you know, peeking to see if anybody's watching them pray. They're, are they there for a conversation with God? No, they're there for them. They're there to show people, look, I, I know God. I've got it. Can you see the Christianity all over me? Can you see the faith all over me? It's like, if that's your mindset, you're missing it. Jesus is like, don't do that. They're missing the real why. They've made it about them. It's become a me-centric thing. It has nothing to do with their relationship to the Father. Don't do that, right? He says, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. If you're going to see yourself doing that, then you need to go by yourself because then you've got nobody to show off to. Then you have to have a real conversation with God, and the only person that's going to hear your words are him. That sounds kind of intimidating, right? It's like, no, but we need it. It's like, come be real with the Father, and then verse seven, when you pray, don't babble on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Again, holy, holy, holy. So come on. I'm just gonna say these things and, and I feel like they're, they're good Christian words. They sound good. I'm just gonna pray them. They must connect with God somehow. Again, praying and bringing about those things. Sometimes, I'll, like, it's not a bad thing. I, I have moments where I just can't help but say the name of Jesus because of the power that is in that. I don't think that means it's a bad thing. But do I do it? It's just like, well... I should pray, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's like, no, is that a real conversation with the Father? Or have I just decided to go through the motions real quick? Don't just babble on. Is there more in the midst of that? Do you have stuff on your heart that the Father knows is there and is saying, bring that to me, but you're not? Don't be like them, Jesus says, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. He knows what you need. He knows what you need in your life. He knows the things that are gonna make it better. He knows the things that we need to change. And he's saying, just come be real with me. Have an honest conversation with me. Show me and give me your heart. Don't be like these other guys. Be real with the Father. So ultimately, Jesus has shown us again the why in our prayer. It matters. Why we go to the Father. The reasoning behind it. We have to recognize that it's there, that there's a why. There's a heart behind it. And is our heart in the right place? And we go to God, and are we really just trying to connect, right? Are we really there to say, here is my heart, Lord? Or is it for something else? Because it matters, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at prayer a little bit more, a little more in depth. Because what I think is when it comes to our prayer life, uh, just like any other thing, it kind of changes over time. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, think of any, think about ourselves as a whole. We go through different seasons in life and we change as human beings, right? Things become different. What we, what we like, what we don't like, how we act, how we interact, all that kind of stuff. It's like things change over time. I believe the same is true for prayer is that our conversations with the Lord in a good way can look different over time, depending on where we are in our walk with God. Some of us are brand new. Some of us have been in it for a while. We're still figuring things out. Some of us have been in the game the whole time and we're like, I got it down. You know what I mean? It's like, so we know what this should look like. But the flip side to that 
is prayer as a whole is not always easy. Amen? It's pr- pr- like I said, prayer comes with a lot of question marks and what this should look like, how it should be, all the things, lots of question marks. And with each stage comes its own question mark. With each stage comes a challenge, its own challenge that we're like, okay, what needs to happen here in my prayer life? Because something is off. Something is keeping me from the true why in this season of my life, why I go to God in conversation, why I go to God in prayer. And so it's beneficial for me to look at that and go, what are the struggles that come my way? And what is the real heart that I need to have in this season so that I can be in a healthy relationship and have healthy, life-giving conversations with my father? Does that make sense? So we're going to look at these different stages of the prayer life, right? Depending on where we're at. So again, it looks harder. It's harder than it looks. And there's three different phases. Like I kind of gave you a hint as to what they were. But the first one is that baby. Okay, the baby Christian. That's not a bad thing. I know it sounds like you're like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. It's like, no, no, that's a beautiful thing. You have begun an awesome relationship with Jesus. And can I tell you the truth? When you're beginning that relationship, you're on fire for the Lord. Christians who have been in it their whole lives are like, I just wish I was back at that place on fire for Jesus. So please do not look at that as a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. And praise God for where you're at right now. This baby, this start of the relationship. The next one is that teenager stage. You know, you're in that mist. And you're like, I know some stuff. I've been in it for a minute. I kind of got some things down. I know some of the ropes, but I'll be real. I still got some questions. And then the last one is the adults. Like, again, I've been in this the whole time. I'm good. I've, I've, I've gone through those other stages and here's where I'm at. I have maturity in my walk with the Lord. These are all very important stages, but they all come with their own challenges. So we're going to walk through the stages and their challenges starting with the baby. So if you are in that baby stage, this is brand new to you. You are just starting your walk with the Lord. Here's the challenge of this stage. We are, again, pretty unsure about all of it. Like, all right, I'll be real with you. I was lost. Somebody told me that Jesus was like, he loved me, wanted to save my life. I was at a service. I felt overwhelmed. And, you know, I decided like, hey, God was speaking to me. I want to give my life to him. But I have no idea what this looks like. I have no idea how to walk this out. You guys remember that time? Maybe you're there right now. You're like, I really have no answers to anything. Somebody just told me this is the way. And I, I found out that I wanted. The Holy Spirit was like, you should do this. And I was like, okay. <laughs> it was like, we're going to jump into this relationship with Jesus. But I got nothing. I got no roadmap. I don't. I need help. I need wisdom. I need, I have questions. And one of the biggest questions we'll ask ourselves in regards to prayer in that stage is, so tell me why. Like, why should I pray at all? Like, what, what is the real heart behind prayer for me as I'm jumping into this new stage? Here's the why. I'll give you some background real quick. We're going to read from the book of Exodus. So we're going Old Testament. And we're going to talk about Moses. Everybody say Moses. Moses, right? We know Moses. So we're going to talk about this moment, uh, or actually this kind of season that Moses had. And this comes from uh, the time that he was on Mount Sinai, and he was spending time talking to God, and God was giving him the Ten Commandments. Okay, remember that? He's up there for a minute. Can you imagine? Just chiseling away. Like, wait, was that? Do you have an eraser? You know, that doesn't work. So he's just getting the Ten Commandments, and God gives them to him, and he comes down, right? And here's what happens. He comes down to the Israelites. Verse 29, when Moses came down Mount Sinai, carrying the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware, he had no idea that his face had become radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. So when Aaron and the people of Israel saw the radiance, the glow of Moses' face, they were afraid to come near him, right? So what's going on here? Moses is spending time with God on Mount Sinai. He's talking to him, learning from him, growing his relationship with him, getting the Ten Commandments. He comes down and he looks like a cast member from Jersey Shore. And they're like, what is going on? What happened to you, man? Too much time in the tanning bed. And he's like, they're like hiding in their tents. Like, did you see him? <laughs> he's like, yeah, I saw him. Don't look at him. And so like, he's walking down. If you keep reading on, actually, Moses recognizes finally like, oh, I'm Yo, you know what I mean? And he sees that people are kind of afraid of him because they're like, God did something to this man up on that mountain and we don't know what it is. Is it an infection? I don't know. So he decides to wear like a cloak and a veil to hide the the radiance, to hide the glow that he had. So why is this important? Moses's glow was evidence of his time with the father. The fact that he was just had a radiance to him was evidence that he has been spending real time face to face with God talking to God, learning and growing with God. And he had the evidence to come down and to show that, to prove that to his people. The point of this is that prayer brings change. Prayer impacts us. When we go to God in conversation, he comes and he's like, I'm just working. I'm I'm gonna make you look, feel, be, live different. And that happens when you spend time with me, when you talk to me, and you're walking in relationship with me. 
I'll give you an example real quick. So when I first got to Grace, actually not long after I got to Grace, uh, my youth pastor's name was Kerry Bryan. He was here uh, at, for, for GSM at the time. It was called Revolution Youth, and he was the, he was the youth pastor. Um, Kerry and I got real close while, while he was here, and uh, his wife, Lori, and my mom and I got really close just with their family in general. And um, just to be honest, there were lots of seasons where my mom and I were just, you know, it was a rocky relationship, and we didn't agree, and there was a lot of brokenness in our home. And Kerry and Lori took great care of me. Um, they had an extra spare bedroom. They got a bed, set it up for me. So whenever I needed time to be there with them, I could go stay the night. I got to live with them for a little bit. They just, they cared for me. I was like a little brother to Carrie and Lori and they just loved on me like crazy. But in that whole season, they mentored me, right? They taught me more about Jesus. They taught me more about this life. Carrie showed me what it was like to, to be a, a man of God, to, to, to love Jesus, to love your spouse, to love your kids, to love each other the way they were called to. He was an amazing example of that. I grew up with not a lot of great mentors and uh, uh, father-like figures in my life. Carrie is one of the first ones who showed me what that's supposed to look like. God used him to do that. So I, I loved these people. The one thing I noticed about Carrie is he had that glow like Moses. There was something different about him. I thought about him compared to all these other guys that I had seen do terrible things. That I learned, here's what you don't do. And then Carrie comes in. And I'm like, no, he's different. He's glowing. He's radiating. And over time, I realized, ah, that's because he knows Jesus. That's because he's in authentic relationship with Jesus. Jesus is showing him and teaching him and growing him how to become this man. I want that. I want to grow like that. I want to glow like that. Who's that person for you? I think early on, we all had those people, those people we looked up to as mentors and were like, that person's glowing. And I want to be like that. I want to be different like that. I want to stand out in the crowd. I want to have an authentic relationship with Jesus like they do because that brings change. Do you see that today, church? Prayer brings change. And I'll say this, side note, okay? Prayer has the potential, okay, to bring change. You're like, what do you mean? If we're back in those spaces where we're just going through the motions, we're going to God for needs and wants, or just to check the box again, if that's where we're at and there's no authentic relationship, are we really gonna experience that glow and that change? Probably not. We've gotta be willing to fully surrender and say, I'm here to be with you, God. I'm here for you and you alone, and I am yours and you are mine. Here we are. That's where the glow comes from. That's where the change comes from. That's when we experience authentic conversation with the Lord, and we begin to build that friendship and grow. So again, why pray at all? Prayer brings change, but it comes from authentic conversation and connection with the Father. Amen? Yeah. All right, the next part. We're in the teenager stage. Come on, make some noise for our teenagers. They're the best. Love them. Come on. Like, yeah, they weren't the best yesterday when they were back talking when I told them to take out the trash. No, I'm just kidding. It's real. I did it too. The teenager. So if you're in the teenager stage, you've had a little bit of a feel of this relationship with Jesus. You're like, I kind of know this. I, I, I know the core, big things. You know, I'm, I'm feeling it. But I still got lots of questions. I'm still figuring stuff out. And the challenge is, is when we get into this stage, we're like, oh, I'm on fire for the Lord from the beginning to start, and it's all good. And then life happens. You know what I'm talking about. Life still goes on. Amen? And life can be hard. Double amen, right? It's like there's challenges of life. And when we become Christians, there's that, there, like we, we say, no, 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 that's not true. But in the back of our minds, you're like, this should be way easier now, right? This should be way different. It's like, no, for sure, there's a difference. And it's the biggest difference ever. But it does not mean that life stops. It does not mean that challenges won't, come your way. It does not mean that the enemy is not, in fact, it means the enemy is more like, I got to get this guy out of here, right? The world still turns and life still happens and the enemy is still trying to get you down even more so. So with that being said, we get into this place of being stuck. What happens is we're like, oh, this is great. And then life. And now I'm like, okay, so what? What do I do now? What do I do with my hands? <laughs> what do I do? I'm just here, and I'm kind of confused because I thought it was supposed to be like almost perfect and great, but life is happening, and it's very hard, and now I, I don't really know what to fully, do I keep moving forward and trusting this thing, or do, do, I, do I give up and realize that maybe it wasn't as great as they said it was, and like, what, what do I do? I'm, I'm stuck, and I don't know the answers. I'm confused. I feel lost. I feel alone. Have you ever been there? See, I, I, I say we can describe that as like a spiritual wasteland, right? This spiritual desert where it just feels like there's nothing, and we're like, dude, I'm I'm dead. I've got nothing here. I had it going for a little while and I hit this thing and now it's just like there's nothing there. I am very stuck. 
So what do I do with this? And the question we're going to ask ourselves in this phase, I think we often do is, why should I keep praying? Why should I not just give up? Because I feel the pull of the old ways. My, 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 my choices I was making before, back in my life, I'll be real, some of that stuff was easier, right? It was kind of nice to just do stuff and not feel bad about it. <laughs> it was kind of nice to just not have to know that this was, God had big plans for me, be intimidated by the big things God wanted to call me to. It's like, I like sitting on my couch. You know what I'm saying? I like doing nothing. It's like, God's like, I got more, get up. It's like, I liked when I didn't have to worry about those things. Again, that all comes from a, maybe a misunderstanding of what God really has for us and those being the best things, right? But have you been there and you're stuck and you feel alone? It feels like that wasteland. So why keep praying? Here's why. Luke 5, 15 through 16. But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster and the vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. Here it is. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. How many of y'all know that even though Jesus lived a perfect life, Jesus had a lot on his plate. Jesus still experienced the world. Amen? He still experienced life sinless, never made the mistakes that we make, right? But he still had stuff on his plate. Life was still heavy, and there was things coming his way. You look at all these times, Jesus would go away to have a conversation with God, right? And oftentimes he would do that when things were heavy. When there was stuff going on, he was like, I can't do this unless I have God's help. I can't do this my own way because it will fail. I need to follow the Father, right? How many times did Jesus say, he's coming in, it's like, I only do what the Father tells me to do because I know if I do it my way, it's not gonna work. If I, know, I know if I do it my way, I'm gonna get stuck. She's like, I'm gonna go to the Father. God, I, I invite you into this place. I invite you into this situation. I need your help. I'm overwhelmed. I'm stuck, right? Before his years of ministry, he got away in the desert, right? 40 days, 40 nights, and he prayed to the Father, had conversations. He fasted and prayed. He's like, I know that if I'm gonna get through this and make a difference for the kingdom, I need you, Father. So I'm gonna spend this time with you. Right before choosing his disciples, the Bible says that he went away and he prayed before he came and said, these are the people, these are the people. He talked to the Father. Who do you want me to take, God? Who are the people that are coming with me? Before his arrest, we know that one, probably the biggest one, right? Just overwhelmed to the point of complete exhaustion, to the sweating of blood in his body. And it's like, he's with the Father. He's like, stay awake, Peter and them. We'll talk about them another day. It's like, it's like Father, I need you. I, yeah, matter of fact, God, if there's a way this can look different, just going to the Father in the, in the hard moments. In the, after the long, hard days in ministry, right? After he fed the 5,000, it says that Jesus got away to pray. Like, that's a big deal. We just poured out on these people. God just used us in a huge way. I need to go sit with him again. I need to get filled up again. Because if I don't, and I let all the craziness that's going on distract me, I can get stuck. I can end up in that spiritual waste on that spiritual desert and go, where do I do now? Because I feel the pool of the old things. What do I do, God. The point of this is that prayer is supposed to bring trust in the Father. We go to prayer, we go to conversation with God to be reminded of his promises and his heart, his love for us, right? A.W. Tozer has this quote, it says, Father, I want to know thee, but my coward heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding, and I do not try to hide from thee the terror of the parting. I come trembling to you, God. I come trembling, but do come. This is beautiful, that last part right there. That's us. And this, when we're stuck in this place, it's like, oh, I just have these pools and these things and confusion and doubts and loss and guilt and all these things that say, don't go to the Father. But I know that the only way I get out of this stuck place, that the only way is to show up at your feet. The only way is I need to come to you. I have to be like Tozer. I do come, God. Even when it feels like I don't want to, even when, when everything else is telling me don't, God, I come trembling, like I come in shambles, broken, just nasty, bad, God. That's how I come to you. And you're like, I'm glad you're here. But I will come. We have to keep showing up. If we're in that teenager stage, one of the things we're going to feel is this battle to go, do I keep showing up? Do I keep going even when it doesn't feel like it? Even when I'm not feeling God, the presence of the Holy Spirit, like I, like I did maybe in the beginning, even in the days where I'm trying to read scripture and talk to God and it feels like nothing's happening, do I keep showing up? Yes, you do. You keep showing up. You keep moving forward. And here's, here, here's the other thing about this. Here's the really cool thing. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. But forget all that. The words of the Father. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. And the, I meant these are the words of the Father. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. God's like, hey, 
just a quick reminder that when you're in that space and you feel like everything's lost, that dry wasteland, and you're like, I'm stuck, maybe I should go back, don't you ever forget that I'm always moving. Don't you ever stop trusting that I am doing and doing and doing and that I have you in mind as I do it. That I have plans for you that soon you will experience the river in the wasteland. Soon you will experience new and abundant life in this place, but you've got to trust me. Keep showing up so that I can grow your strength, so that I can grow your trust. Does that make sense today, church? We've got to keep showing up. We've got to give God the opportunity. We have to, the opportunities to remind us and show us who he is and that he will never let us down, that he will never break a promise, that he will always provide, that things will come through, but we have to keep showing up. We do come. And let me give you this quick side note on this one too. If you're in this space right now, I, like, we, we don't talk about it to say like, that's a terrible place to be. It, it, it's all good. You're not a bad person for being in that place. I would even say that all, or if not most, if, most, if not all Christians, followers of Jesus, we hit this place in our walk maybe more than once. And we're like, this is tough. And God's like, keep showing up, okay? Because what, what, what is really happening is God wants to show us when we get to those places who he is again. He wants to show us, hey, don't forget, I'm the resurrector. I bring things back to life. And that's what this season is. If you're in that space, it's resurrection time, amen? God wants to come in and he's like, let me bring some new life, man. Because that's what I do. When things get dead and things get hard and the world and the enemy are like, nope, you can't do it. God's like, oh yes, they can with abundance through me. And he's like, let me bring life. It's resurrection time for some of us. And God's like, come on, let's keep going. Keep showing up and watch what I do. So again, number two, for that teenage space, when we get stuck, why keep praying? Because prayer brings trust. God's going to help us to strengthen, keep moving forward, to trust that he's got us all the way through. Last one, for the adult. Okay, this is when we're We've been in church a long time. We're pretty mature in our walk with the Lord. We know the things. It's the people in the two earlier spaces coming to us like, how do I do this? You know what I mean? You're like, I've got it, my child. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'll take care of it. Like, I'll teach you. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's this space. We feel like we've got it down. We know. Here's the challenge. We get so used to all the things that we know that we kind of just start to spin our wheels and go through the motions. It's like, I'm just kind of here and things become stale right? I've been through it all. I know how it all works. And so now I've, I've figured out, here's how I'm going to pray every day. Here's what this is going to look like. Here's my schedule. I've got it all down to a T. Not a bad thing, but it can become a dangerous thing. And here's, here, here's why, right? Why change prayer in my life at all? I've got it done. Philippians 1, 6. And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Is that just for the babies? Is that just for the teenagers? Or is that for everybody, right? Because when you're in those two first stages, you're like, oh, that's, that's encouraging. You're like, yeah. It's like, I'm, I'm not doing great right now. It's like, good to know that God's gonna keep working in my life, right? That's fantastic. This is for us when we're in the adult stage too. When we've been through it and we feel like we've got it down, God's like, hey, don't, do you, do you still have breath in your lungs? Yeah. It's like, did you wake up today? Sure did. Well, guess what? I've got plans. I wanna do a work and I wanna use you to do it. Every single day, he's like, I, I want to do more. I want each day, he's like, I want to do more and more and more in your life. And to the day you're with me forever, come on, I've got plans. And I think we, get, we forget that as we feel like we've gotten to a mature place. It gets stale and we're like, I don't really need anything. I've, I've got it down. Isn't this good enough? God's like, mm-mm. There's always room for growth. There's always opportunity to learn. There's always room to do more because I never stop. And we jump in with the Father and say, whatever you're doing, God, Help me to follow. Help me to not be okay with just where I'm at, but to continue to move forward. Here's an, an example that just hit me a couple weeks ago. Um, so Rachel and I, she's not in here anymore, but we just celebrated seven years of marriage. Really cool for us. Yeah. You guys are like, that's it? No. <laughs> yeah, seven. One day it'll be 57. Okay, it's gonna be great. Uh, but we're at seven. And for us, just with all the things that have happened, two kids and all the things in the midst, it's like, it feels like a super long time. And we're, don't get me wrong, like we're super excited and thankful to God for the seven years. Um, and I had the thought, well, like as we were celebrating last week, it was like, man, I feel, I feel like I've got this kind of down. Like I know a lot about marriage. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> chill, chill. You know what I'm saying? But I was like, I think... I think I know quite, like, you know, I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job. Like, come, who needs some advice? You know, I was like, come on. And all of this is a silly example, but it, it shook me, okay? We're driving in the car. I was like, <clears throat> kind of had something in my throat. I was like, 
like 10 minutes, y'all. I was like, Ugh! just trying to clear it out. And I look and I see Rachel's hand and she is gripping the seat. Like, I'm talking about gripping. And I was like, are you okay? And she turned to me and she was like, maybe it's time. And she tells me, she's like, I actually have this huge pet peeve and it kills me, destroys me inside when people clear their throats. <laughs> and I was like, it's been seven years and I'm just now learning this about you. And so, you know what I mean? Like now when I'm driving, I'm like, <clears throat> I'm like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, so it's like, I learned something new about my wife, about this relationship. I'm like, man, I had it down. God was like, no, you don't. <laughs> Not even to the smallest things you don't have it down, man. You nasty. I'm over here like, <sighs> you know. <laughs> Do you see that in our walk with the Lord? In our conversations with him, he's like, there is more. There is always more. There is room to grow. There's room to learn and improve and get better. And it's, and it's not that his heart is just that we, like, it's just like, oh, be the best. It's like, no, he wants the best for us, but he just wants relationship with us. And he's saying, you get that, all these other things, when you just come and be in conversation with me and be real with me. Psalm 96, one and two says, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing a new song. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name each day, each day. With every breath, proclaim the good news that he saves. Sing a new song to the Lord. That's for all of us forever. We're looking for new things. Throughout our relationship, like I said, each stage is different, right? And throughout every season of our walk with the Lord, he will reveal new things about him, about this world, about us, about his plans to us. There is always more. God is so big. We, don't, we, we can't even comprehend the, the bigness of our God, right? how amazing and large and, and just wonderful he is. So why would we assume that we, can ha we have this relationship down? You know what I'm saying? Why would we assume, I got it. I know what I'm doing. It's like, I'm, I know you, I'm glad you know stuff, but there is more. Don't let it become stale. Don't get stuck in that place either. Here's the point of that. Prayer brings life. It's supposed to, okay? Or at least it can. Prayer brings life. When we go to God and we're willing to sing a new song, he's like, oh, I've got more for you. I've got new things I want to do in your life. It doesn't matter if you've been doing this for, for five months, for five years, or 50 years. I've got new things for you. I want to bring new life into this relationship with us. I want to change it up. Imagine if I took Rachel, and we do date nights, right? And we're trying to do them every week. And imagine if I was really good at the consistency. I was like, yo, I got Rachel. We're going to date nights every single week, y'all. That's amazing. Praise God for that. Because that's a huge struggle for a lot of marriages, amen? It's like to get away with your spouse and to have time with them consistently. That's a beautiful thing. And if I had that down, but when we got there, I was like, oh, guess what? We're going to the same restaurant every single week. We're gonna have the same kind of conversation, maybe a little small talk every single week. And afterwards, we're just gonna go home. It's gonna be the same schedule every single week. And we did that for a long time. She's gonna hit me upside my head and say, take me somewhere different. Do something differently, right? Is that marriage gonna be thriving? We're just in the same motions, just going through it like, yeah, it's cool. We, I know already the answers to these. I know we're going there. There's nothing exciting about that. This relationship with God is supposed to be something we are excited about. We're excited to sing the new song. We're excited to be reminded of who God is and what he can do and to learn new things about him. But we have to be willing to get out of our own way and say, let's do something different. Can I sing a new song to the Lord? Maybe my prayer spot is in this room and I close the door and I get on my knees the same way and the Bible's in front of me the same way and the blinds are angled a certain way, but it's the same way every time. It's like, I've been doing this for so long and I'm just going, I'm just spinning the wheels, going through the motions. Maybe it's time to get up and this time sing a new song to the Lord by going outside for a walk and looking at the creation of God and saying, wow, you're real good. And now I get to talk to you about something different, God. And now I get to be real with you about more things in my heart instead of just being stuck and saying, I feel like I've, I've got it down good enough. There is always more with the Lord. That's his heart. He wants to bring more and more and more. It's time to sing that new song. You guys wanna stand up? We're gonna pray here in a second. And I just really quick wanna remind you of something too, um, or not remind you, but share, share with you something that God had laid in my heart uh, yesterday as I was just finishing up stuff for this, for this message. And um, when it comes to prayer as a whole, uh, I think it's so important for us to, re to remember that in the Old Testament, um, prayer was very different, right? For s prayer with face-to-face -face with God, like we have it today, uh, back then, there was a high priest. And the high priest was like considered like 
the top dog of, this, of the community. So in the tabernacle, they had the Holy of Holies. And that was where God's presence, God's spirit was. And only the high priest, after he had been just, he had confessed a thousand times and been completely clean spiritually, only then was he able to go in. Nobody else. Only was he able to go in and speak to God on behalf of God's people and hear from God for the people, right? He was the only one that could have that face-to-face, that time with God. And even then, it's kind of crazy, but they used to tie ropes around their waist, the high priest, and there'd be people outside in the other layers of the tabernacle, and the high priest would have bells. And if they heard the bells going crazy, they knew either the high priest just died because he forgot to confess a sin or something like that, and they would just pull my man out. You know what I'm saying? It's a weird thing. You're like, that's intense. I know. But do you see the challenges that were set up? Like how, how it, was, it was this huge thing to be able just to get time with the Father. And it was only for one person. And now you bring Jesus into the equation because the heart of the Father is, I don't want to do that. What I want is I want my kids to know that they can come, that they are worthy enough to come and sit at my feet to have conversation with me face to face, no matter how broken they are. No matter what they have or have not done, that's my heart. I want to talk to them that bad. So I'm going to go and I'm going to die on a cross for them. I'm going to take every weight, every burden, every sin. I'm going to put on my own shoulders because that means I get to be close to them. That's how your father thinks of you. That's what he thinks of us. That's how badly he wants to talk with us. Do you see the gift of prayer? That because of Jesus today, we don't have to do that. There's no rope. There's none of that. We just get to go in and say, here I am, a mess and all, God. And you love me anyway. And you say that I'm worthy. You give me free, total access Anyway, isn't that a beautiful gift from our Heavenly Father that we get to have those conversations with Him? And not only that, but He wants to, wants to talk to us so badly. So He made a way. So just take that with you as we think about prayers. We move forward in this week and as we go through this series, God's desire is to connect with us more than anything and everything. And He's made a way for us. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you that we get to be here in your house, God, that we get the opportunity to worship your name, to connect with you, Lord. I pray that we don't take it for granted, but we see your heart in the midst, God, that you love us and you want to connect with us, God. You want to talk with us, God. Let there be a fire in our hearts that never goes out to to want to talk to you, God, to pray and to, to be real with you and be authentic. Jesus, help us as we walk this relationship out, God, when we're just starting, God, and we're confused and lost. We don't know what to do, God. We're like the newborn baby who's just like, I don't, I don't know how to do this. Hold our hand as we take these steps and move forward. Or the person who's stuck, God, they, they, they've been in it for a little while, but life is hard, and there's a lot of things the enemy is trying to use to pull us away. Give us strength, Lord, to trust you and keep moving forward. And for those of us who have been here a long time, God, and, and we know the ropes, God, we've got it down. You have more. Help us to believe that and to seek that, to seek more in our walk with you. We love you. We praise you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, amen.